Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Perez and I am a faculty member at Universidad de Chile. Today, I'm here to tell you about the techniques, observations, and diagnostics of protoplanetary disks that we use to trace the outer disk. And this is in the context of the 2021 Sagan Exoplanet Summer Workshop that is focusing on circumstellar disks and young planets. And I thank the organizers for a nice opportunity to come and tell you about this fascinating topic. And at the same time, at the end of the, of the talk to advertise a bit some of the things that we do in, in my research group. And so to begin, here is our current view of when and where planets form. And this is a cartoon of this process for low mass stars, stars like our sun. And, and in, this, in, this, um, um, in this workshop, uh, or at least in this topic, or in this talk, <laughs> I will be focusing on the protoplanetary disk phase, which is the phase that comes after the early collapse in the pre-stellar core, and then the formation of the protostar and the disk around this, the, the, the star, which is the class zero one phase. And it's really when the envelope has been dissipated and the time where we think all of the action happens related to planet formation. Eventually, of course, the disk dissipates and we are left in the final debris disk phase. And there will be plenty of talks discussing how do we get here to this protoplanetary disk phase, how the disk dissipates, and eventually uh, the last or the next 100 million years uh, on the debris disk phase. And when we look at a protoplanetary disk, which will be the, the focus of this talk, what it is really is a flare gaseous disk, flare to maintain hydrostatic equilibrium as you go farther and farther out. Um, in this disk, the solids are not uh, equally located and they're mostly segregated to the mid plane. And so these components, the gaseous component and the solid component are not co-located. And so as you can see in this nice diagram, in the atmosphere of the disk, we're able to find gas and small dust grains that are um, lift up in the disk, while the larger dust grains settle to this mid plane. And so in the mid plane, we're able to find both the gas and dust component. Generally, this, these larger solids are also um, um, uh, radially distributed in a different way, more concentrated, closer to the star, uh, than uh, in the entire uh, uh, radial distribution. And so when we look at these two components, um, the gas and dust component, um, there are some differences. The gas is the one that dominates the total disk mass. On average, we think that uh, this is a 100 to 1 uh, ratio between the mass of gas that we find in the systems and the mass of dust. Uh, the bulk of the material uh, comes from molecular hydrogen. And since this is not a very good emitter, we have to trace this material with other species that are found in the gaseous disk, but a much, much lesser abundance than molecular hydrogen, orders of magnitude lesser abundance. And as I mentioned too, the distribution radially and vertically of this gaseous component is actually quite extended compare, of course, to the solid component, uh, or what we just refer to as dust. So the dust dominates the total disk opacity, despite being really, really the, uh, a small percentage of the mass. And it's composed of solids that range in size from submicron sized particles all the way to large planetesimals. And for the solid distribution, compared to the gaseous distribution, radially and vertically, the solids are distributed in a more compact fashion. When we look at a protoplanetary disk, just to give an order of magnitude size, we think of its diameter of you know, 100 astronomical units. And if we place it in the nearest star forming regions, which are about 150 uh, parsec, we end up with a typical, typical um, size of one of these disks of less than arc second, uh, one arc second. So that means that to probe one of the systems, we require high angular resolution. 
And what is good is that we live at a time where several facilities uh, that work in, uh, the, at shorter wavelengths as well as at long wavelengths can really provide us this high angular resolution needed. And so here are two examples uh, of the angular resolution uh, achieved by an A meter class telescope working at uh, one micron of um, 32 milliard seconds. And that can be replicated with longer baselines with a telescope like ALMA, for example. And why do we want to uh, think about telescopes like ALMA and like infrared wavelengths? And this is, this is because multi-wavelength observations will trace different regions in a disk. And this, of course, will tell us something critical about the structure and the distribution of the material. And so the first thing to, to understand here in, in, in a disk is that very close to a star, densities and temperatures will be larger. The, um, there is more material closer to the star than farther out, and the material being closer is warmer. And so this means that there will be radial temperature and density gradients with increasing temperature and density towards the inner regions of the disk. But at the same time, because uh, um, 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 and at the same time, there are also vertical and temperature, uh, vertical temperature and density gradients. So that means um, in the inner, uh, not in the inner, in the mid plane of the disk, so very close to uh, the same plane of the disk. The surface density of the material, the amount of material that there is, is much larger than in the atmosphere of the disk, so higher up in the disk. And the opposite happens with the temperature. The surface or atmosphere of the disk is much warmer uh, than the midplane as you go towards the, the uh, this midplane of the disk, the temperature gets much, much colder. And so all of this gives, right to, gives rise to a very special uh, uh, spectral energy distribution for one of the systems, uh, where here you see the star, the young star, and here you see the excess of emission at longer wavelengths coming from this disk that is being warmed by, by uh, the central star. And when we look at uh, what regions in the disk are being probed at different wavelengths, what we see is that at shorter wavelengths, most of the uh, uh, emission really comes from very close to a central star. And as you go further and further away, it gets colder. So it's better probe with uh, longer wavelengths, but at the same time, it gets less and less optically thick. And that means you're not only able to probe colder material, but you're also able to probe it near the mid plane. And this is why we have to go to much longer wavelengths if we want to probe the bulk of the disk, okay? And how then do we probe these different disk regions? As I just said, the warmer innermost regions are better probed at shorter wavelengths. And so inwards of 10 AU, which is the inner disk, you're better probing these uh, UV optical and infrared uh, wavelengths. And there is a full talk by Joan Najita discussing exactly this. And uh, when we want to probe where the bulk of the mass is, the cold outer disk, and where we want to probe where the action is happening, which is the mid plane of the disk, then we have to go to much longer wavelengths. And so first, let me show you here the cumulative distribution at each wavelength of, uh, um, um, of the observed emission in a spectral energy distribution. So what you see of the total flux of, at 4.5 micron mostly comes inwards of a fraction of an AU, okay? And when you go to longer wavelengths, you start probing regions much farther away, 1 AU, 10 AU, and eventually the bulk of the disk. Uh, 
And so this is why you want to go to longer wavelengths because longer wavelengths probe much better also the distribution of mass. So here's the mass of the disk. You can see that outward, out, outwards of 10 AU is where most of the mass is. And this is where we want to probe, uh, uh, for example, the distribution uh, of the available material in a disk. And so we want to go to longer wavelengths to, to do this. Now, when we look at where vertically, so here's the vertical direction as a function of the radial uh, direction. Uh, and we look at a plot of where in the disk is the observed flux being emitted from. What we see is that not only at shorter wavelengths, we're probing inwards of you know, 10 AU, but also we're probing the upper disk layers. So most of the material inwards is much more hidden uh, and, and we don't have direct access. And it's only when we go to really long wavelengths that we probe uh, uh, regions closer to the midplane that also probe where the bulk of the mass comes from. And so this is how then we probe these this cold regions near the midplane all the way out in the disk. But to probe uh, the surface of the disk that is much warmer and also what, where most of the mass comes from, which is the gaseous component, we have to use uh, other probes. And for this, for the surface, we use the scat scattered light emission from the surface. And to probe the gas, of course, we use emission lines. And so uh, different, tra different tracers that will trace different regions in the disk. And just to show you an example, of how different these tracers can look at, uh, let's look at the disk around the young stars HD 143006. When we look at the thermal emission in, uh, uh, in ALMA observations at high angular resolution, uh, what we see is that the midplane of the disk is composed of several rings, a nice clear gap, an inner disk that also has a cavity and this big asymmetry here. And this is actually comes from the uh, uh, much closer in to a star than when we look at the molecular emission in CO in this case, that probes uh, really the uh, entire extent of the disk. Um, and probes the surface and looks pretty much uniformly distributed, okay? And when we look then at the infrared scatter light, we're probing regions in the surface that are, um, that are having different illumination in a way. And, and we know this because of the uh, very different uh, uh, distribution of light that we see in these observations, where you see a east-west clear asymmetry, a ring of emission here, perhaps some shadows and this bright asymmetry that actually matches the location of this asymmetry. So pretty much all, sorry, not this matches uh, the location of uh, near this gap, sorry. And so, um, and so when we look at the extension of the scatter light and thermal emission and molecular emission and the distribution, we can construct, construct a picture of, of uh, the disk in much greater detail than if we were looking at one of these tracers. And so what do we learn about disks when we look at long wavelength continuum observations? And the thermal continuum that we observe from solids is really seen all the way from the near infrared to centimeter wavelengths at the temperatures that, and densities that we have in protoplanetary disks. And if you solve the rate of transfer equation for dust and you exclude scattering, what you will come out uh, uh, on the emergent intensity for thermal emission will be this equation here that relates the observed intensity with the Planck function at the given temperature of the dust and the optical depth of the uh, solids being observed. 
if you take this equation to the optically thick limit, that might generally happen when you're looking at the disk at short wavelengths, and then the observed intensity traces directly the Planck function, and then it traces directly the temperature of the material being emit at that tau equal one surface. And when you take this equation to the optically thin limit, which generally occurs at long wavelengths, you can express the observed intensity as a function of the Planck function at the temperature of the dust, multiplied by, by tau, by the optical depth. And the optical depth is given in the absence of scattering by the absorption opacity and the dust surface density of the material. <clears throat> er, sorry. And this means that you can relate the observed emission uh, with the amount of material in the disk. And this is what people normally do then. Uh, you integrate this equation above over the entire disk, and you're able to relate then the mass uh, of dust or solids to the observed flux density. Of course, taking into account the distance of the object and uh, making some assumptions about the opacities and the temperature of the material. And many, um, uh, many, many surveys have done this where they relate the observed flux density to a solid mass. And so you're able to constrain protoplanet protoplanetary disk masses from this thermal emission and at long wavelengths. Uh, based on these assumptions, then many multiple there have been many demographic surveys uh, with ALMA. And here's just one recent example of all these uh, continuum observations at long wavelengths of many, many disks, in this case in Linz 1641, um, that then you can relate to dust masses. Um, and for example, construct this plot on, on the right here, where uh, you compare uh, the different uh, uh, distributions of disk mass, so here in the bottom is, is disk mass, for different um, star forming regions, some young, some old, and you try to see if you see some sort of evolution in the solid, solid disk mass in these systems, for example. Um, another thing that we can do at, uh, at long wavelength observations is to constrain the spectral index. If we are in the optically thin regime, then we might be able to say something about the dust properties uh, of the emitting material. So going back to this equation again, in the optically thin limit, what you have is the observed intensity related to the dust opacity, the surface density of material, and the Planck function at the temperature of the dust. If you were to take this in the Rayleigh Gene's limit, so this will generally happen if you are at really long wavelengths or at really high temperatures. So there are places in the disks, in the disk where this could happen, but it's not uh, clearly happening, for example, in the midplane. But just to as an example, you should be able to then uh, express all the frequency dependence of the Planck function as nu squared and the dependence uh, with frequency also that generally the dust opacity has. And so suddenly, if you take observations at multiple wavelengths, you should be able to relate then all frequency de dependence that you observed uh, with variations, for example, related to the dust opacity. And why then do we want to do this? This is because when we look at the dust opacity for different particle size distributions, and so here are the different curve, color curves for a particle size distribution where the maximum grain size has been set to very small sizes like one micron, 10 micron, or very large sizes like one centimeter or one millimeter. What you see is that at long wavelengths, so we're talking in this range here, the dust opacity observed goes as a power law with these long wavelengths. And we generally parameterize this power law with the dust opacity spectral index, beta. Okay? And when we look at the behavior then that, that the dust opacity slope has, it becomes 
from being quite steep to much, much shallower as you increase the maximum grain size. And so this spectral index behavior will tell you something about the maximum grain size in your population of grains. And so we can look at, at that directly by looking at what are the different values for the opacity spectral index when you have different particle size distribution. So here is the uh, beta values as a function of the maximum particle size. What you see is that uh, small sizes, those related to the interstellar medium, for example, generally give you um, high uh, uh, values of beta. So beta around one and a half or two, um, depending on, on, on assumptions related to the composition and distribution of these particle size uh, of the particle size distributions. But it's only um, possible to get low values of beta, uh, low values like those shown here, when you are um, in the regime of large particle sizes. So when your distribution of dust grains has large particles, then you generally observe lower values of beta. And so this means that by observing the intensity and the spectral behavior of the intensity, which is given by the opacity and by whatever is doing the Planck function at the temperature of the emitting material, maybe in the Rayleigh genes limit, maybe not, it, you can relate then the, the, the shape of the spectrum with uh, uh, properties of the dust grains. For example, the shape of the spectrum that is really shallow uh, will tell you something about the large, the large grains that might be uh, in the system, for example. And so people have done this, uh, inferred dust properties from, from thermal emission at long wavelengths based on all these assumptions. And there have been many grain growth and evolution studies. Uh, and so one way to parameterize all of this is just say, let's measure the spectral index of the emission. So what is alpha, where is alpha, is this a spectral index? And this way you can quantify both contributions from the opacity spectral index beta and the Planck function B nu to, uh, as a function of the temperature, these two contributions that, that shape the spectrum. And what people normally see, uh, and here's a nice summary from one of the reviews that I mentioned uh, earlier, is that when you look at the disk integrated spectral indices from many, many surveys looking at many, many different regions, what you see is that you would, if you expect small particles like in the interstellar medium, then you will expect uh, spectral index values here in this region. But what we generally see and what we generally observe are much lower spectral index values. Those plotted here for all these different surveys. And when you look at resolved spectral indices, so when you measure the spectral index of the emission as a function of radius, because you have high angular resolution observations, for example, you also see these gradients in the spectral index. So these low values of a spectral index might be related to then low values of beta, for example, and higher values, higher values of beta. And so that means there is a change in the properties of the dust grains. And perhaps this can be related to smaller grains in the outer disk and larger grains in the closer to the star. Now, the issue is that what we have discussed so far has several caveats. Uh, all, these all, these, uh, all the things that I mentioned before make several assumptions. And so first, the emission may not necessarily be optically thin. So when you compute this emergent intensity, assuming this, you're able to get to this expression, but this may not be the case if the emission is not optically thin. And the other important issue is that scattering cannot really be ignored at this long wavelength. And so this proposition here, that is the emergent intensity when you exclude the scattering, can also, can, cannot also be taken at face value. And so if you again solve this rated transfer equation, and compute the emergent intensity of those thermal emission, but now you include scattering, you have to include uh, the albedo of the, of the dust particles. That of course will depend 
on the dust properties. And so the equation that you may end up with, uh, it relates the Planck function with the uh, optical depth, but also with this function, complicated function that I'm not gonna write here, uh, of the uh, optical depth and albedo, okay? And this has an effect, the inclusion of scattering has an effect, an effect that uh, can be seen, for example, uh, when we infer the optical depth using this standard equation here on top, and we compare it to what is actually happening. So here is the um, observed, we're calling here, how, do you, how will you infer an optical depth under these standard assumptions here on the top. And so if a scattering is not included, the actual uh, um, absorption scattering will go with the infer optical depth in a one-to-one -one fashion. So this will be the dash line. But as soon as you include the scattering, and that means some of the radiation is scattered away, you might start observing lower the intensity values, but it's not because the emission is more optically thin, it's just a, an effect from, from scattering. And so you, what you will see, even for low albedo, albedo values, when you are in the optically thick regime, so here in this part of the plot, what you will see is this reduction of the observed or inferred optically, uh, optical depth. And so you will be inferring low optical depth, you know, an optical depth, for example, below zero here when the albedo is 0.9. And what is really happening is the optical depth is really high, it's above zero, but you're making an inference that is wrong by using this equation and not considering the effects of scattering. And another really interesting thing is that it also has an effect in the spectral index of the emission. And, and so here is again, the, as a function of the optical depth, and now as a function of the maximum grain size, the colors show different values for the spectral index. And there are regions here where it will be possible when you include scattering to obtain a spectral indices below uh, the standard maximum value or minimum value that you should get in, in the absence of a scattering, which is two. And so when, in, when you include a scattering, you might be able to get a spectral indices that are lower than two. And this is something that was observed already if we go back to this, to this plot here, where here is a value of two of the spectral index and many for many, many disks, we infer even lower uh, disk integrated spectral indices lower than two. This could be due to optical depth, but it could also uh, have an influence on, uh, on scattering, okay? <clears throat> and this is because this happens for certain particle sizes in the regions where you're highly optically thick. Now to show one example, when, when you include then, when you don't make these assumptions on optical depth and, and scattering as, as before, what type of constraints on the dust properties can, can we obtain? And one way to do this is to use multi-wavelength result observation, where you can then simultaneously constrain dust properties and the solid mass. And so here are some ALMA observations at high angular resolution um, in the TW Hydra disk, uh, spanning a range uh, from about 0.9 millimeters all the way to 3.1 millimeters. And from computing the emergent intensity using a scattering, you can compute this intensity as a function of three parameters, as, as we explained before. <clears throat> the temperature of the material, the amount of material, solid material I'm talking about, and the maximum grain size of this material, which will give you in uh, right away the albedo and all these other properties that, that you needed. And you assume here a, a fixed dust composition and a fixed particle size distribution. And you're able then to constrain, and so here in colors are the constraints on the temperature 
as a function of distance from the star, so warmer, closer to a star, colder, further out, the amount of solid material, and you see these nice variations happening, and also the uh, maximum grain size as a function of radius. And you're able to, for example, notice that at the location of rings in this system, the surface density and the maximum grain size is higher compared, for example, with the gap location. In those regions, the amount of material and the grain size sizes are smaller. And so this tells you something about uh, dust evolution and trapping. And this is something that you will hear about uh, together with all the different aspects that I mentioned before in the talks related to dust grain evolution, okay? Now going to, to a different topic, another very important thing that we can learn from long wavelength continuum observations is to characterize substructures. And at long wavelengths, it is really, really critical to have very good sensitivity and high angular resolution if you want to characterize these substructures. And so here's a gallery of observations obtained in circumstellar disk before the era of ALMA. And at the resolution and sensitivity of these observations, it was very hard to pick up substructure. But after ALMA, this is the same millimeter um, wave gallery of disk, but as observed by ALMA now. And what you see is that a multitude of substructures appear, and, and it's um, something quite interesting to relate these substructures to the process of planet formation, for example. And here's a gallery then of all the beautiful images that ALMA has obtained at few AU resolution. And in on average, what we most commonly find is that the most common substructure is rings and gaps. And there have been even detection in quite young disks, like, like uh, disks around class one objects, for example. Uh, when looking at spiral substructure, at least in thermal dust continuum emission, which is what I have been describing, it generally look at, looks at two arm asymmetric. And when we look at asymmetric substructure, that uh, seems to be rare. And you will be hearing more about this in the session, in the talk, I'm sorry, related to substructures and planet disk interactions. And so what do we learn about disks when we look at scatter light? Well, first, the stellar emission is orders of magnitude brighter. So it requires high contrast imaging in order to do this type of studies. The grains, the small grains that are located in the surface of the disk mm -hmm. are the ones that will scatter the incident radiation from the central star. In the optical wavelengths, most of the radiation that will be incident will be starlight. And when you go to longer wavelengths, there will be some incident radiation that actually comes from thermal disk emission. As you go uh, farther and farther away, the stellar irradiation drops. It drops as one over r squares. So when you observe the outer disk, you're being sensitivity limited, as the outer disk regions are poorly illuminated. And uh, one can take advantage of polarization and use it as a natural, natural, natural chronograph. So the light from, from the star is not polarized. And when the light is scattered uh, by dust grains in the surface, as you see here in this diagram, it becomes linearly polarized. And the way this polarization acts depends on the viewing angle and the properties of the particle. But what you can say then is, observed in polarization, that way the amount of light that comes from the central star will, will be much less as the central star is unpolarized. And you will be able to pick out much better the polarized light that is being scattered by dust grains in the surface. And um, when we observed the radiation in polarization and in total intensity, wh what we observe will depend on several factors. And this includes, of course, projection effects. So the properties of the dust grains are very important. Depending on the size of the grains, the composition, the porosity, 
variations in the total intensity and also in the polarized brightness will take place as a function of the scattering angle. And here, just to get the language for everyone on the same page, here is a dust grain and there is some incident radiation on the dust grain. The dust grain will scatter this radiation and it will be different for different uh, scattering angles. Uh, you may have some backward scattering radiation, some forward scattering radiation, and radiation at different angles. And the intensity of this radiation can also be different. Maybe you will have more forward scattering or less backward scattering, for example. And this is for a single dust grain. And then when we think about the full disk, then um, we, we have to think as well about the um, scattering angle. And so here's a plot of the degree of polarization as a function of the scattering angle. If the scattering angle is zero, so it's uh, almost parallel, uh, 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 um, you will have forward scattering. When the scattering angle is backward, oh, sorry, it's 180, it's almost the other, almost half a circle back, you will be talking about backward scattering. And where it's uh, perpendicular, we're talking about this 90 degree scattering, okay? And so when we're looking at a disk with a certain uh, inclination with respect to the line of sight, and for example, we're looking at forward scattering, there is a stellar radiation that impinges on the disk, this small dust grain will produce radiation on every direction, but uh, most of the radiation that we observed here will come from forward scattering, and this will be weakly polarized as the degree of polarization in this, um, in this particular dust grains, composition, porosity, properties, etc., cetera, um, is low. When then you're looking at the emission on what we call the back of the disk, you will be looking at backward scattering. And again, you expect the emission there, given this polarized brightness uh, as a function of scattering angle, to be weakly polarized. And then when you look at, uh, uh, the, uh, at this direction in the disk, what you will be seeing is a 90 degree scattering. And here you expect to see the most polarization from the disk. And so this will be reflected in the images that we observed in, in the systems, okay? Where you will expect low polarization or high polarization or high uh, brightness um, in polarized light in different regions of the disk and depending on, on the viewing angle, of course. Another very critical aspect is the vertical structure in the disk. If you have much larger flaring in a disk, and so here is a very flat disk, and here's a very flare disk, and as you increase the flaring, this, this large flaring disk will be more efficient and absorbing the incident radiation, and thus will produce more emergent intensity in, in scatter light. And another important aspect that we sort of hinted already about is projection effects. Uh, when you have large particles compared to the smaller particles, and depending on the wavelength that you are observing these particles, uh, you may have a very extremely forward scattering if you have large particles, or a much less uh, forward scattering uh, if you have smaller particles. And so that means that if you're viewing the disk completely face on, so if you're an observer at the top of the screen here, then uh, you will see very little um, emission uh, signified by this arrow uh, when you're looking uh, completely face on if the disk has a lot of large particles. While if you're looking to a very edge on system and you have large particles in the system, then all of this extreme forward scattering will be quite bright in your images. And just to see then some of these differences of what you see then in, in uh, polarized intensity, for example, depending on the viewing angle, you can compare it here with this very edge on disk where you see the, the, the nice ring of emission 
uh, around the star. And this very phase on disk where the, the polarized intensity seems more uniform as a function of the azimuthal angle of the disk compared to the more inclined system. And the same with the vertical structure, you will see many disks with very different um, distribution of scatter light given by the um, width or very much, very large flaring that the disk has uh, compared to, for example, this other object that is much more uh, flat, okay? And so there is a wide variety of, of observations that you may have. And of course, you will hear more about this on the dust and grain evolution talk. I wanted to just close with a very interesting thing that you can do when you observe scatter light, as it is very sensitive to illumination, you can probe the vertical structure, the radial structure simultaneously. And here's a nice simulation of the misalignment that you will, the, that you will have in, in a disk. So here the inner disk is being misaligned with respect to the outer disk, and you start getting shadows here. <clears throat> And at the beginning of that simulation, I don't know if you noticed, but the shadows were quite broad and then they got very narrow. And so this depends very much on the degree of uh, misalignment that you have. And you can imagine that if you have radial structures and vertical structures in a disk, you will have very different patterns for all these shadows. And a very nice example of this is the, uh, is the observed shadows in, in this particular system. So here are the observations and there are these very broad shadows, but there are also several special fe features that you see here <clears throat> um, that needed to be explained. And the authors here can only explain the set of like, scatter light observations if you have not only an inner disk that is misaligned, not only a ring that is misaligned, but both an inner disk and a ring that are misaligned. And so you can, what you can see here is the model and the model looks very nicely compared with the, with the actual observations. And so when we look at molecular line emission, uh, what we're seeing, the observed intensity, depends on the temperature of the emitting material and how much of the species that we are observing and how it's distributed. And it also depends on the disk kinematics. And something um, that we normally look at are image cubes. And so I wanted to put this very nice diagram from, from Brian Loomis just to show what are the different measurements that we get when we looked at molecular line emission. And so an image cube is this cube um, where you have the intensity um, uh, as a function of the bright ascension and declination observed in the sky. And you have this also as a function of frequency or what we call channel. If you were to extract a single pixel Okay, so you take one pixel in this image, let's say this black pixel here, uh, we could take a look at the spectra of the, of the disk at that particular location. You could also integrate over a certain region here, the red region here, and that will be integrating over an aperture, and you will see the spectra of that entire aperture. Another thing you can, you can do is to take a look at the uh, actual map that you see for each frequency. This is what we call the channel map view. And what you see here are the intensity of that molecular line at different frequencies or different velocity channels in the disk. And finally, you can sum these channel maps. Uh, you can sum the channel maps in intensity and you get what we call moment maps. This is the moment zero map. You can sum in, in weighted by velocity, for example, and, and here you get a velocity map. And so these different things you can, you can do with one of these um, image cubes of molecular line emission. And as I said before, this emission is very sensitive to the disk kinematics. And so if we have observations of spectral lines that are well resolved in frequency and that are resolved in spatial, especially as well, we can probe the disk velocity field. 
And this is because very close to a central star for a disk that is slightly inclined in the, in the sky, like in this example, we will see Keplerian rotation of this material around the disk. And so here is a, an example then of, the, of one of these moment one, so velocity maps showing uh, material coming towards us, material going away from us and really orbiting around the star. And different locations in, the, in this line will come from different um, localized regions in the disk that are orbiting at these specific velocities. And so you will see these butterfly patterns, for example, here in, in the observed channel maps. Now, things that we can do uh, to learn about disks at long wavelength emission is to probe disk properties. For example, line emission is very sensitive to temperature. And when you're looking at a, a line that is optically thick, you can probe the temperature of that tau equal one surface. And so here's a nice example of probing the, the disk temperature from 12CO and 13CO observations of uh, the disk around IM loop by uh, uh, Christoph Wandt, uh, and where he compared with an analytical model of the structure, temperature structure of this disk, and the observations match quite well their model. Another important thing is that line emission is also sensitive to density. And so when you're looking at optically thin line, you're going to be probing the temperature and the density of, the, of that material. And of course, the abundance of the observed species. And so you can look at multiple lines and you can look uh, uh, at multiple tracers that will have different properties regarding optical depth, regarding abundances, regarding temperatures. And you can construct uh, chemical models of, of uh, these systems here. And of course, I. Um, advertise that you should be looking at the talk by Karin Oberks that deals exactly with this, with what can we learn about gas and chemistry in protoplanetary disks. And uh, since I mentioned it already, line emission will be sensitive to these kinematics. And I just wanted to show two examples of things that we can do with observations that are well resolved in frequency and that then they will probe the velocity field of the disk. And so here's an example of the deviations that we will expect from, from Keplerian velocities when you have a embedded planets that are perturbing the velocity field. So here is one of these simulations. Here's the gas surface density. You have here three planets. And with respect to the Keplerian velocity, here in percentage, you see very small deviations, some very large near the location of the planet, so they are localized, and some that are overall in the velocity field of the disk that are of much less contrast. Another thing that, that people expect is that in, in disks that are undergoing gravitational instability, so the disk is quite, quite massive, you can also expect deviations from Keplerian velocities. And these deviations, uh, occur over actually many channels. And they are not necessarily localized, but they are related to the observed spirals. And so here are the two examples of one localized perturbations found in a protoplanetary disk. You see this perturbation, sorry, you see this perturbation here. Uh, and this perturbation is not seen in all the channels, and it's only seen in this particular region in the disk. And if you do a simulation of how the perturbation by an embedded planet will look, a planet of a few Jupiter masses, you see a very nice deviation in the Keplerian profile that should be smooth, but it's not. It looks kinked uh, due to the presence of this planet. And so maybe these localized perturbations can be explained by the presence of unseen planets in this protoplanetary disk. And another place where we see this type of perturbations are the perturbations that we will expect from Keplerian rotation. So here, these blue curves show where the Keplerian rotation is. And we see these sort of spurs coming out and these very large deviations. And we think these are, at least in this particular system, related to gravitational instabilities. And so with gas observations, you can also explore the kinematics in the disk and say very important things about 
either the um, state of the disk, gravitational instabilities, or the presence of planets. And so I will conclude now just mentioning that from all these observations, we can probe and learn about the different components in a protoplanetary disk. <clears throat> When we look at submillimeter and centimeter emission, so long wavelength thermal emission is what we're probing, and we can constrain properties of the large solids and properties related to the disk structure. When we are looking at infrared scatter light, this is at short wavelengths, we can probe properties of the small grains and of course of the disk structure as I show you with these shadowing effects, for example. And when we look at the gas observations, either in emission lines, uh, that are optically thick or optically thin uh, at long wavelengths, we can probe properties of the gas, the structure of the disk, as well as the kinematics of the systems. And uh, before I finish this talk, I just wanted to advertise the research group that we have on planet formation at the University of Chile, where we have been doing studies from protoplanetary disk studies and early phases. These are the things that done by my postdocs and former group members and searchers, searches for young planets, like what is being done by my PhD student, Sebastian Corquera. And uh, you're welcome to send me an email if, if you want to know more about us, or um, if you want to ask us about any of the latest research coming out of my group. And with this, I thank the organizers for this invitation, and I stop. Thank you. <laughs>